First of all, as you said, you shook things up a little bit, which I think is important. I think so often we tend to look at things from the same perspective, even when the situation dramatically changes. And I think especially in a world, as we discussed earlier today, where it seems like everything is changing and we're actually drifting more apart than actually coming closer together in terms of the USA with Trump, in terms of the UK uh, with Brexit, in terms of the European Union as well. As Dr. Storber was saying, you know, where, where is the leadership in Europe? You know, can we look to Germany now? Can we look to France, you know, Spain, Italy? It's a challenging situation. So I wanted to ask you maybe two questions to keep it brief. Uh, we still have a, a tight time agenda and I want to take a, a few questions from the audience. For, first question I'd like to ask you is maybe not a typical question uh, that you're used to uh, as somebody who has a big background in trade, uh, former director of the World Trade Organization, former Under Secretary General of the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. But that's exactly why I wanted to ask you this question. Uh, in the world situation that we are currently in, uh, many would say what we need is better trade relations. Uh, many would say we need better global governance or, or the political solutions. My question to you here at the Institute for Culture Diplomacy, you know, can culture diplomacy make a contribution? Uh, what value do you see for cultural diplomacy in assisting with the challenges that we're currently in, where it seems like cooperation, whether it's trade or economic cooperation, almost any kind of cooperation, it seems like that goal is getting harder and harder. Uh, you know, we at the Institute say cultural diplomacy is about dialogue, understanding, and trust. Um, what role might cultural diplomacy pay, play in a broader framework, together with the economic and political aspects, from your point of view, maybe looking more at somebody focusing on trade or global governance? Well, uh, uh, Mark, thank you for asking this question because I, I was already referring to the reset, the reset of the belief in market economy already in the beginning. And the resetting, particularly to change our mindset about global market economy, you need to have a new philosophy. Now, being an, a being an Asian, we've been talking a lot in Asia about Asian values. And the one I want to talk, just to answer your question, just this example, there are, there are a few more, but this example from the so-called sufficiency economy principle or philosophy of our late king, who just passed away after 70 years of reign last year, is very important. Because in this sufficiency economy philosophy, it does teach people to be looking at the way that they do their business in a sufficient way, not self-sufficient, not to, tr not, not to move away from trade. But if you want to do something like investing in a new project, this is something that you look at the way that it's sufficient, it's enough, it's in the middle ground, it's not going excessively over the board. And it also teaches you to remain cautious that with all kind of investment or undertaking, economic undertaking, you also look at the downside. You will take care that contingency solutions are there because don't go overboard, take the middle path, and take the middle path with always the thinking that there will be something that you would have to take off in case things are not move in the way that you, you, you want it to move. At the same time, to have passion. This is to go back to the first book of Adam Smith. If you have read the book on the wealth of nations, and I would recommend you to read, not to read totally because the book is unreadable in the fullest form, the theory of moral sentiments. The theory of moral sentiments was written nearly 15 years before the, 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 19, the, the 1776 uh, book of the Wealth of Nations. In the book of the theory of moral sentiment, Adam Smith first taught people to have moral sentiment, to be compassionate, to be honest, to be sincere, to be, to be uh, uh, trying to to, to avoid taking excessive risk, but he didn't use this word, but to be cautious. So in order to frame the market mechanism that would make Busher and everybody works for something which is so-called, he never mentioned the word invisible hand, actually, by the, by the way. But we economists tend to uh, ascribe a lot to, to Adam Smith's Wealth of Nation. So before people move into greedy, unlimited, unbridled market mechanism, Competition. People must learn to have compassion for fellow people. This is in the first book. And this is what our king, our former king, used to teach us in his philosophy of sufficiency economy. To be sufficient in the way you do it, to, to take middle ground, to take risks with a kind of foresight that you will have fallback position, 
to be to be compassionate with your your fellow human beings and things like that. And you and you look at the way farming sector in Thailand is being driven by this this garbage. Farmers in Thailand are not self-sufficient, but they are they are sufficient in the way they do fishing, they do some livestock, they do some orchards, some vegetable. It's 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 a wonderful uh, achievement, uh, and and awards has been given by the U United Nations to our king as a development king. The first award, and there's been many awards given to him, and, and this is something that happened. It's not a change of economic policy per se. Watch me. It's a cultural change. That's why I ask, answer this, give this answer to Mark because it's a change of mindset, change in your philosophy, and this is mainly driven. Some people say Buddhist philosophy, but again, this kind of cultural background, I would like you to study. Now, just to add to that, I just been to to Beijing last month. They appoint me as an honorary advisor in one foundation, which is called Confucius and Mencius Foundation. Confucius and Mencius Foundation. Now, as you know, Confucius uh, has one great, a uh, few great things that he has said in the past. I mean, respect for your senior people, elders and parents and everything. But one thing that Confucius has done is to use the word empathy. Empathy. Everything you do, Confucius said, do it with empathy, meaning thinking of others all the time. And you look at economies in the world this day, do they think of others? No, they don't. They do what we call beggar thy neighbor. Just get yourself rich, make others poor. Me first, you later. This is the thing, you see. That is why this is not, a, this is an insincere world. So, I mean, I know that this is something difficult. That's why, again, cultural diplomacy is something that you have to learn from the value to the value, culture has values. And the values are embedded in the philosophy driven, I don't know, sometimes by religious belief, sometimes by the, the philosophy of your leaders. But from Asia, I would like to give you this kind of example. You, it's up to you whether you could consider it. And I would actually like to recommend to Mark that from time to time, maybe you should invite some of us from Asia, from China or Thailand to talk about these things, particularly you know, the colleagues that I've met now at the Confucius Mencius uh, uh, Foundation in China, they're not owned by government, they're just descendants of the 79th generation after Confucius. Because Confucius is about a few thousand years ago. This is the 79th generation of, 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 of the, uh, uh, the, the, the family name uh, that still live in Shantong in the northern part of China. And they want actually to help the global community to learn more about how we in the East thinking about the, the, the resetting of, the, of the, the philosophy behind market economy. Thank you very much. And since you actually referred to your comments in that way, let me refer to the way you introduced yourself as an Asian. I'd like to ask you a question about Asia, and then we'll give it to the audience. Uh, you and I over lunch were talking a little bit about Donald Trump and implications for the world, this and that. And you made an interesting comment. You said, uh, Mark, Donald Trump is actually not necessarily bad for Asia. Uh, and in that sense, what you meant is I think the focus uh, of the USA may be going away a little bit from Asia in terms of development, et cetera. And he was mentioning how actually that has some benefits uh, in the sense really for the Asian partners to work more effectively as a team, uh, that this actually could have positive implications. So I wanted to ask you a question here at the Berlin Economic Forum about Asia. Uh, uh, we have initiatives such as ASEAN, uh, which many are very optimistic about. Um, you see now the counter example let's say, in Europe with the European Union, uh, maybe slowing down a little bit. And <laughs> many are wondering, you know, what's going to happen with Europe? That used to be the big success story for multilateralism. So I wanted to ask you, what shape do you see ASEAN, and let's say that the Asian group taking uh, over the coming years? Uh, will it move? in a similar direction for more unity, such as the European Union did, uh, or given the way the world is maybe breaking up now, Brexit, USA, et cetera, might it take a different route? Or, or what do you expect uh, in terms of Asia, in terms of multilateralism in the coming years? Well, I, I am <coughs> sincere when I said that Trumpism is good for Asia because Trumpism is going to move the US as a hegemon out of Asia in terms of less intervention into our economic and geopolitical affairs. Asians have been living like this for hundreds of years together without the kind of hostilities that we've been seeing the last few years in the South China Sea and in the East China Sea. It's been, it's been more than a few hundred years. I, I, I nearly would say a thousand years because we all lived like this long ago. There never has been any, any war fought between Asian countries uh, along this line. Now, a few years ago, 
President Obama said uh, if uh, U.S. would do a pivot into Asia, meaning that there is a stake for U.S. in Asia, which is a good thing. We all would like to balance Japan, China, India, U.S. all together in the Pacific Ocean. But what the U.S. was doing was to try to create another hegemon, another, a hegemonic regional integration exercise called the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the TPP, which includes 12 countries except for China. Except for China. They said, oh, we welcome China, but what is written in the TPP is just something that the Chinese cannot accept, and they know it. And President Obama, actually, in his last State of the Union, you know, beginning of last year, beginning of 2016, his last State of the Union, he said, we have to do TPP in Asia, otherwise the Chinese will come in and do the rules on trade in Asia. China, China is just a new member of the World Trade Organization. They hardly now abide by the trade rules, and just in the last few years, I don't think, the Chinese are not going to do this rule. ASEAN is there, Japan is there, India is there, but the U.S. wants to do the rules. In the TPP, they have imported everything that is a U.S. rules and regulation in the TPP, which is WTO plus, 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 much further away from the WTO, which actually needs the multilateral agreement. So, Mark, this is something that I see with Trump, that he just withdraw U.S. out of TPP, TPP collapse. So the ASEAN-based integration is moving along the right way. We are doing integration anyway, but with a center as ASEAN, as ASEAN Asian. So the, there'll be a new integration exercise with 10 countries of ASEAN, together with China, Japan, Korea, Australia, New Zealand, India. A, a, a new, what we call the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership of 16 countries, which have the level of production, level of development close to each other, in a way that we can drive forward that ASEAN-centric uh, 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 globalization, regionalization exercise, and less with intervention from outside. This is a good thing because intra-Asian intra trade has been growing as never before. So it's about more than 50% of the total trade. Only the European Union has a larger intra-national trade uh, larger than, than, than Asia. So if you leave the Asian alone, Asia can be the driving force of the global economy. This is the important thing. I'm saying all this not because of the benefits for Asia, but Asia has been in the last 10 years the major driving force, half of global growth in trade, and maybe also in global growth, output growth, has been derived from growth in Asia. Manmohan Singh, my friend, a former Prime Minister of India used to say that Asia is a global public goods. India, China, global public goods because we produce growth at the level of six, seven, eight percent that you see nowhere else in the world these days. Maybe in Africa, pre before the, the 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 Great Recession, but now also Africa suffers from growth, lack of growth. And and secondly, uh, you you ask the question, what is for, for Europe to be done? Europe has been working with Asia all along without actually imposing on Asia the kind of regime that the U.S. has been doing. I have to say this straight, mentioning also the U.S. We have something which is called ASEM. ASEM is Asia-Europe summit that takes place once every year, like, like, like APEC, which has a summit between the, the Asia-Pacific uh, heads of, of states. Now, ASEM has been doing work in the area mainly of trade facilitation, trade rules uh, that can facilitate trade, transportation that can help the landlocked economies, uh, uh, standards of goods and products uh, that should qualify uh, uh, goods for some of the advanced economies. Now, these are positive things, and, and this is a thing that, that, that European Union can, can do more to help Asian economy to, to, to progress. And the thing that is important this day is the transfer of technology, particularly the green technology. Asia actually is left behind in terms of technology to green our economy. Because technology like this, if you have to buy it, it's expensive. And people, even if they would, uh, would have the technology, they don't do it easily. So you need to have other countries that come along and do this kind of investment jointly with the countries in Asia. So I wish that Europe could do the same thing as US has been doing, but investing more in the green technologies, solar, whatever, hydro and, uh, uh, and wind power, 
uh, a lot of things that, that's, uh, that, that Europe, particularly Germany and, and you know, European Union can, can do to help us. So it's, it's a way to help Asia to reach the 2030 agenda of the UN uh, by, by joint partnership, which is one of the goals. One of the 17 goals is joint partnership in the global economy, not really by imposing your own rules and regulation on countries that are just much poorer than you. It cannot actually even dream of, of meeting some of these uh, requirements. Excellent. Thank you very much for those reflections. And I think in many ways uh, we see that as some great optimism, looking also for what may come uh, also from Asia. I'd like to now give the microphone to you. I asked two questions. Now I want to let you ask two questions or comments. And I want to give the preference to women this time, if I can, because we have a little bit of a gender balance problem today. So in that sense, I think you were first. If you could briefly introduce yourself, and then we'll come to you. So brief comments, questions, brief responses. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. It's been Fascinating. My name is Rumbi, I'm from London. I just wanted to ask, you spoke earlier about the tide of globalization and how the yachts have managed to sail on it, whereas the smaller boats from the poorer countries have sunk under that. What do you think is the potential for the smaller boats coming together to form a cruise ship and working unilaterally to be more competitive? My question may appear a bit uh, silly, but my field of studies is law, not economics. So I would like to ask how um, organizations like WTO measure uh, national growth, because you, you mentioned uh, national economic growth. For example, in my country, Greece, the government may say that uh, this year we had 2% growth, but the citizens see un high uh, unemployment rates, businesses closing down but the politicians still say grow 300%. So on which terms do they actually measure this growth? For example, how WTO measures growth? Well, uh, international organizations are not known to, to measure growth, but, but they can help you to check, you, they, they can help you to check uh, the kind of reporting system. And this is uh, something that the IMF has been doing and the World Bank has been doing, the, the WTO does more work in the areas of, of trade statistics, of trade statistics. For example, if Greeks, if Greece, if, if, if Greece is not doing much better in their trade, it should not have this kind of a growth that you were talking about. That, that, that the WTO can actually help to provide for the answer. But in terms of measurement of the, of the, of the, of the net value added in the system, it's a task of the World Bank and the IMF to give you the kind of answer that you were asking. I am also quite perplexed by the kind of an early, I would say, an early recovery of the Greek economy in spite of the fact that the, the, the indebtedness is still very massive in Greece. At the moment, there, there is no way, just let me, because this is something that I have been itching all the time in talking to European Union, there is no way for Greece to come out of this crisis without haircut what the IMF has been recommending all the time. And it's blocked by one of the European countries that I don't want to mention the name because I still need their hospitality here, but. <laughs> 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 you cannot really, because, because this, is, this doesn't happen around the world. You look at Argentinian debt, uh, debt in Mexico, all over the world. I mean, at this size, which is much lower than what Greek's debt is about, uh, you cannot do it without, without the haircut. You have to, you have to have the private sector borrowing suffering. Now, that they cannot do it because I know European banks will suffer. And this is in the hands of the ECB, you see. The ECB knows which banks have been actually lending money to the weak economies in Europe. So they should be ready to provide a kind of stress test. What the US has been doing in the wake of the 2008 crisis, to do stress tests to measure out actually which, which commercial banks are in need of capitalization by the government. And then you go and try to do the haircut. Then you come and support the bank so that they can survive, and Greece can come up and, do, and can, can actually sustain the kind of growth that, that, that we would like to see. Otherwise, no, no, no way. Uh, the first question about what are we to do? Uh, you know, left alone, the South has been actually growing very well, and the trade among the South, you know, it's about now more than half of the trade of the global community. But the problem with the trade among the South is that the rate of protectionism between the open countries are even higher than the trade between the open countries and developed economies. This is, this is just a dilemma. The poor countries 
are actually protect, protecting their markets against each other rather than against the, the, the more advanced economy, which is, I don't know why, but it happens. Many times higher. So the thing that at Angtad, where I used to work, we've been trying to do the kind of exercise besides the global trade round, that to do a, a separate trade rounds for the countries in the third world, I mean, they don't want us to call third world anymore, but I call it for the, the open world, that they can come around together and try to reduce their own, their own tariffs among themselves and reduce the non-tariff barriers that exist among the open countries. Don't ever think that the open countries among themselves do not put up barriers. They put up barriers among themselves, and this is crucial. You look at countries in Africa. Africa trade more with Europe rather than with themselves in Africa. And this is why, because, because the inside intra-Africa bottlenecks are much higher, not only in terms of tariffs, but in terms of transportation, in terms of, of, of standardization. But trade with Europe has been uh, always growing like that all the time. So I think we need to, we need to come together and do this. Secondly, uh, we need to negotiate well with the, with the uh, advanced economy in a way that uh, what has been agreed in the trade round, in the Doha round, should be realized as soon as possible. Not to wait until the, 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 the signing of the single undertaking, completion of the round. Because what has happened, like I said from the beginning, is something which has been dealt with on behalf for the sake of the open countries. That should, mean, that should be put uh, into practice as soon as possible. Because I don't think we can wait for the other round. To be frank, at the moment, the round will not be finished the Doha, the open agenda will be the first agenda that will not see the end. It will go on like this. So my suggestion is that to do a partial round, finish it now with the things that are on the table and leave the rest as a building agenda. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you for giving a lot of uh, food for thoughts. Uh, and uh, I think also some inspiration as well in terms of the future Asia and what's also cultural diplomacy can maybe do. So I'd like to ask everyone to please join in expressing our sincere gratitude to Dr. Supachai Panachpakti. Thank you.